huge sums of money. So if this is not a win-win-win situation, I am not sure what is. I want to thank Senator Wyden for his hard work uh, on this amendment, and we look forward to working with my colleagues uh, to see that it gets passed. Uh, Madam, uh, Madam President, thanks very much. The Senator from Oregon. Madam, Madam President, I'm going to be very brief, and I thank uh, Senator Cornyn for his, for his courtesy. Just to respond, I am pleased to be able to be supportive of this amendment. I just want uh, colleagues to get one number with respect to this proposal. Our assessment is for every one dollar made available under this particular amendment, it would leverage ten dollars worth of loans for homeowners to weatherize across the country. So when people talk about getting bang for the buck, that is the relevant you know, number. Make one dollar available through the states. This is not run by the federal government. Through the states, uh, under this program, results in $10 worth of loans being made for weatherization across the country. I think that's getting bang for the buck. I thank Senator Cornyn for his courtesy. I hope colleagues, when we get a chance to vote on it, will support this particular amendment. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President. The Republican Whip. Madam President, our friends on the other side of the aisle keep promising that once the President's health care law is fully implemented, it will deliver fabulous results. Well, unfortunately, they have a massive credibility problem. Indeed, despite all the promises made to the American people during the debate and passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2009 and 2010, every week brings more evidence that the President's health care law is, number one, already discouraging full-time job creation, number two, destroying many existing full-time jobs, number three, hampering medical innovation, and four, encouraging further executive branch overreach. And of course, the worst is yet to come, because amazingly, once this law was passed in 2010, it wasn't implemented before the 2010 midterm elections, nor was it, has it been implemented fully before the 2000, uh, at, between then and the 2012 presidential election. And so, really, the American people have yet to full, the full, feel the full force of the uh, implementation of Obamacare. Yet, what we see already is discouraging, to say the least. Once Obamacare is fully implemented, it will drive up individual insurance premiums. We've already seen some indication of that around the country and the rates that have been announced for the individual exchanges that have been created. Uh, that's because of phenomena like guaranteed issue and age banding, things which basically have, have, have engineered the insurance industry so that it no longer is insurance uh, but prepaid health care. Secondly, it will cause millions of Americans to lose their current coverage. Uh, remember the President said, if you like what you have, you can keep it. That's proving not to be true. And three, it will weaken Medicare and Medicaid. You recall during the Fourth of July recess, the administration announced that it would not be confirming taxpayer eligibility for the Obamacare premium subsidies until 2015. Even though the subsidies will begin flowing, taxpayer dollars will be flowing a year earlier in 2014. In other words, for a year under the administration's current plan, people will be able to get taxpayer dollars without any independent verification that what they are representing in terms of their eligibility for those tax dollars without any independent verification. No safeguards for overpayments or fraud. Earlier today, the House of Representatives passed legislation that would delay the Obamacare premium subsidies until the administration establishes a system for verifying eligibility to make sure those tax dollars are not stolen or obtained under false pretenses. It's one of those measures that should be a no-brainer. After all, whatever you think about health care reform, everyone should want to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse. And yet, our colleagues on the other side of the Capitol, House Democrats, were almost unanimously opposed 
to the No Subsidies Without Verification Act. And the majority leader in this body refuses to allow a vote in the United States Senate on similar legislation. Again, what you would think outside of Washington and the Beltway as a no-brainer, but we have an alternate universe here, apparently. Apparently, our Democratic friends are okay with that, but I certainly am not. Neither are the 26 million people that I have the privilege of representing in Texas. At a time when the federal government is almost $17 trillion in debt, shouldn't we be doing everything humanly possible to try to crack down on wasteful spending and fraud? Well, I would think so. But here's another question. Wasn't Obamacare itself sold on the basis that it would reduce health care fraud? Wasn't it supposed to improve oversight? Well, that's what we were told in 2009 and 2010, but apparently those promises have now been forgotten. If the President and his allies are wondering why they have such an enormous credibility gap on Obamacare, the answer is actually quite simple. So many of the promises that were made in selling Obamacare have simply not been kept. The, it is simply not performing as advertised. Just think about what we've learned just the last few months alone. In July, the National Bureau of Economic Research has published a study showing, showing that Obamacare may cause substantial declines in aggregate employment. In other words, unemployment will go up and the number of people getting work will go down. That same month, the Wall Street Journal reported that between 2009 and 2010, excuse me, 12, 2009, 2012, the number of doctors opting out of Medicare nearly tripled. Now, in my state, if you're covered by Medicare, you, you might find a doctor who will take a new Medicare patient, you might not. Only about two-thirds of Texas physicians will take a new Medicare patient because the reimbursements have been slashed to the point where many doctors simply can't economically take a new Medicare patient. This is like the old, uh, the old shell game where people are told they have coverage, but they can't find a doctor that's willing to see them based on that coverage. And the problem for Medicaid is even worse. In mid-August, the University of Virginia announced that Obamacare is projected to add $7.3 million to the cost of the university health plan in 2014 alone. That's just at the University of Virginia. About a week later, National Journal reported that for the vast majority of Americans, premium prices will be higher in the individual exchange than what they're paying currently for employer-sponsored benefits. I have two daughters that are in their early 30s. They are the ones under Obamacare who are going to have to pair, bear the financial burden for subsidizing the health care costs for older Americans, and it's unfair. And this is the very same cohort of the population that's finding it harder to find jobs and finding that the burdens of our broken entitlement programs are going to be visited on them, not to mention their share of the federal debt, which boils down to about $53,000 each. So if I were a 30-year-old or 30-something, I would be pretty irritated at my elders for not being responsible and, make, and pushing that debt and those responsibilities on me, if I were them. Last week, Investors Daily reported that more than 250 employers had cut work hours, jobs, or taken other steps to avoid Obamacare costs. We heard a lot about this, including from some of the largest labor unions in the country, saying that many employers, in order to avoid the employer mandate and other mandates associated with Obamacare, or simply taking full-time jobs and turning them into part-time work, and obviously people with resulting cut in their income. Just a, a few days ago, a local media outlet in Michigan reported that Obamacare will cost the medical device company Stryker fully 20 percent of its total research and development investments. Now, this is, has to do with the medical device tax, which is part of the way that Obamacare was paid for, which punishes medical device companies that create jobs here in the United States and that create new and innovative medical equipment 
that helps improve outcomes and helps make our lives better. Yet they are being targeted under Obamacare for this medical device tax, which is chasing jobs overseas and stifling innovative medical research. In addition, the Huffington Post has reported that the Trader Joe's grocery chain will be dropping health insurance coverage for all employees who work fewer than 30 hours a week. And as I said, we've seen some of our organized labor unions, representing, particularly the one representing IRS employees, announced that it does not want its members to receive health insurance through Obamacare exchange, even though the IRS under Obamacare will be implementing the exchanges for everyone else and the individual mandate. In other words, the very people responsible for administering Obamacare want no part of joining the exchanges, and that should speak volumes to all of us. The truth is it wasn't supposed to be this way. Whether you one of the most ardent advocates for the Affordable Care Act or whether you were a skeptic like me who didn't believe it could work, I think the facts are undeniable. The Affordable Care Act was supposed to help the middle class, not cut their work hours and threaten their benefits. It was supposed to help young people, not drive up their insurance premiums. It was supposed to help medical innovation, not lead to factory closures and cancellations. And it was supposed to help make Medicaid stronger, not overload a broken system. It was sold on the basis that it would strengthen Medicare, not trigger an exodus of doctors from seeing Medicare patients. My point is, whether you were the most ardent advocate or whether you were a skeptic, Obamacare is not living up to its hopes and the promises made by its biggest fans. And we should work together to try to find a way to deal with that in a responsible way. One final point, Madam President. The pre President of the United States has apparently decided that Obamacare says whatever he wants it to say. For example, he's unilaterally delayed both the employer mandate and the eligibility verification I spoke about just a moment ago, simply because it has proven to be politically inconvenient. Now, many of my constituents are outraged at this and wonder how a law that applies to everyone in America can be, uh, can be uh, enforced on a piecemeal or cherry-picked basis. My only explanation to them is that the President of the United States controls the executive branch of government, including the Department of Justice. Congress has no authority to, uh, to enforce these laws, only to pass the laws, expecting that the executive branch will administer the law and enforce the laws as written. But that hadn't happened. Meanwhile, the IRS has announced that it will violate the text of the law and issue health subsidies through federal exchanges, even though, law, even though the law clearly states that those exchanges, that those subsidies, excuse me, that those subsidies can only be issued through the state exchanges. Here again, another example, in this case, of the IRS rewriting the law where it proves to be convenient uh, to achieve a particular outcome. This is, should be and is an outrage. Indeed, on issues ranging from the tax subsidies to the employer mandate, Obamacare has effectively become government by waiver. There's no way to sugarcoat it. The law is damaging our economy, damaging our health care system, and weakening our constitutional checks and balances. And our legacy of being a nation of laws, not of men. That's why the best course of action, I believe, is to delay Obamacare, dismantle Obamacare, and replace Obamacare. I've co-sponsored co legislation numerous times it would delay both the employer and individual mandate, for example. It was introduced last night, the latest version, as an amendment to the current energy efficiency bill. My ultimate goal is to replace Obamacare with patient-centered reforms that do several important things, hopefully that we could all agree on are important principles of whatever our health care system is. First of all, it would a replacement would make sure that a health care system is in place where price 
and quality information is fully transparent and readily available. And that's so people can compare and shop and people can use the market system to make sure that people who provide those goods and services do so at as low a price and as high a quality as they can get. A replacement system would include a, a tax code that treats individuals uh, individually purchased health insurance the same way as employer provided health insurance. A replacement system would would make sure that every American is protected against catastrophic expenses. Now this is one of the uh, phony ways that I've heard people try to say, well, if you replace Obamacare, you'll eliminate the system against dealing with people with pre-existing conditions. And that's just false. It's just not true. You don't need this behemoth legislation that costs $2.7 trillion, whatever the final figure is, in order to deal with people with pre-existing conditions. What we could do is simply help fund the uh, state-based exchanges that provide coverage to people with pre-existing conditions at a far cheaper price and still accomplish the same goal. So anyone who tells you you have to have Obamacare to deal with pre-existing conditions is just trying to sell you a bill of goods. We ought to have a, a, a system in place in replacing Obamacare that gives all Americans an opportunity to save money in tax-free health savings accounts so they can use that money to pay for their health bills and if they don't need that money for that purpose they can save it just like an IRA or some other savings account tax-free by the way. We ought to have a replacement system where the states will have much greater flexibility in improving Medicaid. You know, we'd be happy in Texas for the federal government just to write us a check for its share of Medicaid and let us administer it in a much more cost-effective and a much higher quality sort of way. And we need a system to replace Obamacare that protects Medicare for future generations and a system that preserves the right for the most important decisions about medical care to be left to patients and their physicians. Now I remain confident that someday, someday we can make this kind of health care system a reality. But first, we need to delay if we can, if we can't replace it now. Uh, certainly as Obamacare starts crumbling on itself, we need to protect the American people from this catastrophic and epic failure um, and provide an alternative that has the sort of uh, qualities that I've just described a moment ago which will make sure that people have access to quality health care at an affordable price in a way that doesn't let Washington interfere with doctor-patient relationships or decisions that we ought to reserve to ourselves and our families when it comes to our health care. Madam President, I would yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Oregon. Madam President, often it's a little hard to divine what is actually going on on the floor of the United States Senate. I just want to make sure that folks understand that the pending business before the United States Senate is a bipartisan bill offered by the Senator from New Hampshire and the Senator from Ohio on energy efficiency. That is the pending business before the United States Senate. And one of the measures of this bill is the extraordinary support. We've got business groups like the Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers and the round table, business round table, joining with the National Natural Resources Defense Council. That is not exactly a coalition that comes up every single day, but you have it because of the good work that Senator Shaheen and Senator Portman have done. So they had all that in place as we came to the United States Senate. And since that time, and mind you, Madam President, this has been a day and a half now that we have been on this bill, senator after senator has come to the floor of the Senate in a bipartisan fashion, starting with Senators Inhofe and Senator Carper, the list just goes on and on, I've repeated it several times, have come to the floor to say this is a good 
energy efficiency bill, and we've got some ideas on how we can make it even better. And so they have offered their bipartisan amendments, and they have not been able to get a vote on those bipartisan amendments to a bipartisan bill. And I think it would be fair to say that if they could get votes on those bipartisan amendments, they would pass overwhelmingly. And we've got a bunch of others, certainly, in the wings as well. Now, who is the loser, Madam President, because we haven't been able to get those amendments up and we haven't been able to move ahead on this bill? The people who are the losers are the consumers. I'd say to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, they're the job creators because this is clearly legislation. If you look at the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, uh, a business-oriented group, legislation that will create thousands of jobs, and taxpayers. Those are the losers. Those are the losers because a bipartisan bill which would be improved by the bipartisan amendments that colleagues want to offer, cannot go forward because it is stuck in this procedural mass, uh, morass. So what you have is consumers losing out on billions of dollars of savings and losing those thousands of jobs that I've mentioned, and our country missing out on the dramatic energy savings. Madam President, that seems foolish even by the sometimes stilted standards of the Beltway, you know, here, to pass up that kind of opportunity. And the reason the breadth of this bill, the uh, breadth of support of this bill is so extensive is because this bill isn't a run from Washington federal leviathan. This doesn't involve any mandates. The focus is on the states and in the private sector, Senator Sanders just talked about an idea, for example, in terms of weatherization that I find very uh, appealing. It's voluntary, like virtually this entire, you know, bill is. So I was very pleased when the leader, Leader Reid, indicated that he was continuing to look for a way to uh, move forward. Uh, I and others have been talking to various us senators and the leadership about how to do that. I just hope that will be possible and we will see tangible progress made here uh, shortly. I think it is so important to respond to what people said all summer to senators. And I suspect they said the same thing in Massachusetts that they said in New Hampshire and Oregon and across the country. And that is People at home are tired of this food fight in Washington. They're tired of the, the bickering and the pettiness. They'd like to see us show up, work together in a bipartisan way on issues that are fundamental to their well-being, and in particular, grow an economy with more opportunities for high-skill, high-wage jobs in the middle class. And that's certainly what you do when you promote some of the top technologies associated with energy efficiency. So the public said, you senators ought to go back to Washington and do exactly what Senator Shaheen and Senator Portman have been talking about, an effort which has been supplemented by similar kind of bipartisan uh, proposals from various uh, senators. So that's where we are, Madam President. Day and a half into the bill, Senator after senator coming to the floor wanting to offer relevant bipartisan amendments to a bill that will be good for the productivity of the country, good for our environment, good for a job a creation. And I'm going to stay at my post here and just hope that we can find a path to go forward. There are discussions uh, I know uh, taking uh, place and uh, I'm very grateful because Senator Shaheen and Senator Portman who may have decided that he was going to try and grab a sandwich for a minute have uh, have been here at their posts trying to advance the bipartisan focus of this uh, legislation and with that uh, Madam President I see my colleague from New Hampshire uh, on her feet and I will yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from New Hampshire. Well. I just wanted to thank Chairman Wyden for 
making that clarification that in fact we're here on the floor not to talk about health care or other unrelated issues, but we're here to talk about energy. And as you pointed out yesterday, as Senator Murkowski pointed out, Senator Portman, as I've pointed out, this is the first energy bill to come to the floor since 2007 on an issue that's so critical to the future of our country. It's nice to finally be having a debate. It's nice to finally be able to listen to people on both sides of the aisle talking about why energy is so important and talking about their amendments and the difference that those amendments will make for people across this country. And I, I didn't have a chance because um, we got interrupted by health care after you and Senator Sanders talked about your amendment on residential energy efficiency, but I wanted to applaud you both for that effort. Senator Sanders talked a little bit about the challenges faced by people in his home state of Vermont. Of course, my neighboring state of New Hampshire, um, the presiding officer, state of Massachusetts, the state of Oregon. These are all states that are cold weather states. We have cold winters, and in New Hampshire, um, we have an inordinate number of people who heat with home heating oil, number two home heating oil, which is very expensive. And we have an awful lot of old buildings because New Hampshire is one of the first states of the original 13 colonies. We've got a lot of buildings in the state that are old, that really need to be upgraded to be more energy efficient so people can afford their heating bills. And this legislation that this amendment that you all would like to introduce if we could ever get on the bill and get to some of these bipartisan amendments um, would really help address the challenges that people in the Northeast, in the Upper West, in the Upper Midwest all face with the high costs of heating their homes in the wintertime. You know, I would also point out that it's not just important to us in the North to have more energy efficient homes, even though in the Northeast, we have more older homes. In the South, it's equally important because air conditioning is very expensive as well. And so people who can have their homes be more efficient when they're trying to cool them in the summer also benefit. So this is really an amendment that is a win-win. And as you pointed out, Senator Wyden, as has been pointed out for the last day and a half, this legislation is legislation that is a win-win for everybody. It's a win on job creation. It's a win on helping to prevent pollution into our environment. It's a win on um, reducing the threat from dependence on foreign oil. So the connection to national security is there. And, and it's a win in terms of saving consumers the cost of energy. And in New Hampshire, we have the sixth highest energy costs in the country. So we really need to be able to save on energy costs because it's good for our businesses, it's good for our residents to not have to pay those high costs. And I really hope we can find some way to move forward on this bill, to move forward on these bipartisan amendments because this is a place where we can come to some agreement, we can work together, we can get this done, and the people of this country are expecting us to do that. So again, thank you for your leadership, um, Senator Wyden and Senator Murkowski, who must be with Senator Portman getting the sandwich right now. <laughs> um, but hopefully we're gonna stay here, we're gonna keep um, having people hopefully come to the floor, talk about their amendments, about what we can do once we can get on this bill to really make a difference. And the bottom line here is that this legislation, in addition to all the other good things it would do, with the amendments that are being offered, with the underlying bill, this will help create jobs. And it will do it in a way that doesn't cost a lot of money in terms of subsidizing those jobs. It's the private sector working in conjunction with public policy in a way that will really encourage that job creation. So I continue to be hopeful we can come to some agreement and move this legislation in a way that I know the people of this country are expecting. So thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor.
Madam President. Senator from Oregon. Madam President, we're going to stay and continue to work with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to try to find a path forward on, uh, on the bill. I just wanted to announce uh, that Senator Reid is a courtesy to all uh, senators because uh, we know that their schedules are busy to announce that there will be no recorded votes today so that senators can have that in information and for uh, all of us who are working on a path to move forward on uh, this bipartisan energy efficiency bill will continue those efforts uh, through the afternoon. Madam President, I yield the floor. And, uh, and Madam President, I would note the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
No more votes scheduled today in the Senate. They've been working on an energy efficiency bill uh, co-sponsored by New Hampshire Democrat Senator, Democratic Senator Gene Shaheen and Ohio Republican Rob Portman. While we wait for a senator to speak, Senate Democrats today talked about their agenda. We're here to announce a record was uh, just broken. It's the first time in Senator Schumer's entire career that he's been late for a press conference. You sure that? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I met, as most of you know, this morning with uh, Senator McConnell, Leader Pelosi, and the Speaker. It lasted about 45 minutes. It was a good meeting. Uh, as we all know, the Speaker has a problem, how to get the government funded. I want to be as helpful to him as I can be. But I had to be very candid with him, and I told him very directly that all these things they're trying to do on the Obamacare is just a waste of their time. You can see what's on the floor today. Um, I was given every assurance over months that get on energy efficiency. We haven't done an energy bill in a long time. Let's do an energy bill. <clears throat> so. We're doing Obamacare, not energy efficiency. We have 18 bipartisan amendments that are waiting to be offered. Can't do that. So, as I explained with the other three leaders, their direction is a direction to shutting down the government. This is not the time for political stunts, not contraception on a transportation bill, not Obamacare on an energy bill. If they want to work with us to improve Obamacare, let's do it. But not in these uh, guerrilla attacks. We're ready and willing to work with them on this and anything else. We're, we have been worked very hard legislatively and through the administration to fix issues that needed to be fixed. We'll continue to do that. The exchanges are going to start in just a matter of a couple weeks for the vast, vast majority of Americans. In Nevada, for example, health care costs are extremely low. They surprised everybody. Our doors are open to anyone who wants to work together to improve this law and anything else we need to work on. So let's stop these uh, really juvenile political games. Uh, the one dealing with health care for senators and House members and our staff. We are going to be part of, exchange, uh, of exchanges. That's what the law says and we'll be part of that. 
will be treated like the rest of the federal employees? No, it's nothing unique that employers help pay for health care. Ford Motor Company, Sears, doesn't matter. Have a little press conference going on over here? Okay. Um, it, it doesn't matter uh, who you work for when you have health care and the employers involved. It's just like what we have. So this is all a diversion to keep us from focusing on energy efficiency and just to try to embarrass the president. I have every Thursday, welcome to Washington, or have people come from Nevada. It's hard to tell them what we're doing because we're doing nothing. As I said on the floor today, the anarchists are winning. Anything that can be done to slow down, hurt, or and get rid of government in any way, that's good. Shutting down the government, obviously, is what the majority of the Republican caucus wants to do in the, in the House. So those in touch with reality, and most everyone is in touch with reality, should understand that passing a clean CR is the right thing to do. Then, of course, we have to look at uh, the debt ceiling, but I guess that will come later, but not much later. A small but vocal minority of Republicans here in the Senate, less than half of the Republicans in the Senate, seem to live in an alternative universe to keep demanding the impossible. And of course, as I've just said, a majority of the majority feel that way over there. If the Republican leaders keep giving in to the Tea Party and their impossible demands, they must be rooting for a shutdown. There's still a common sense solution to all this. Common sense could prevail. But I think that it's best can be summarized by the President's con press event yesterday, where uh, a member of the press said, what's next? He said, I don't know. But if you have a couple amendments, Speaker. give them to me. The Speaker, what did I say? Yes. Uh, Speaker, I'm sorry. Um, give them to me. Give me a couple of them, and they'll vote those down, too. Senator Durbin? Thank you, Senator Reid. I know we call this a news conference, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of news, because what I'm about to tell you has been a story you've already written many, many times over. It's a story that says the House of Representatives voted 60, I guess House and Senate have now voted 67 times to defund Obamacare, and it's gone nowhere. It's a story that also tells about the House, when it decides to come and visit us here in Washington, uh, can't do the basics. It's a story where the House of Representatives won't take up a budget resolution, which Senator Murray passed in the Senate in a conference committee to try to work out our differences how many months ago? Six and a half, five and a half. Five and a half months ago. It's a story about a House of Representatives that basically, uh, in a Senate a group of Republicans, that won't allow us to go to appropriation bills after badgering us for so long about regular order. It's a story of a House of Representatives that can't pass a farm bill. We've been at that for two years. We passed it twice in the Senate. And it's a story, obviously, about the House of Representatives unable to fund government, facing now another Tea Party Republican shutdown of our government, and maybe worse, a shutdown of our economy. It's not news. It's an old story. But it's one that I think saddens me and a lot of us who believe that this Congress, this government, can help make this a better country for the people who live here. I, I sometimes sympathize with Speaker Boehner, but the fact of the matter is, if he wants to lead for the good of this nation, he has to step beyond the Tea Party faction in his caucus. If he would call our farm bill on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives, it would pass. I believe if he called our immigration bill on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives, it would pass. If he would call on the floor a basic funding level of the Senate budget resolution, it would pass. The fact is, he has stopped this. He has bowed to this willful minority in his own caucus at the expense of this government and of this nation. He'll pay a price for it, and the price will come in the election. When the American people finally realize, and you can see it in the polling numbers, that Congress may not be the most popular institution in America, but within Congress, the Republican leadership is being identified for our failures here in Washington. Mr. Schumer. Thank you. Well, you know, we have this extreme hard-right group 
in the Republican Party, and they have chosen this moment once again to pick their fight on Obamacare. They're perfectly blunt about it. They think threatening the government sh a government shutdown, holding the full faith and credit of the U.S. hostage, is the place they have the most leverage. Now, they, we agree. They want to keep debating Obamacare? Fine. But there's a time and a place for everything. It's called the election of 2014. Let them go debate in 2014 as they tried in 2012 whether there should be a Republican Senate, a more Republican Congress, so that they can finally repeal Obamacare. But not at the expense of average Americans. Republicans should train their efforts at 2014. But to hold everything hostage, which in this kind of government set up by the founders, they can do, it's wrong substantively, it's wrong politically. When they threaten a shutdown, they're telling cancer patients that research on cures for diseases can't go forward until we kill Obamacare. They're telling highway construction workers that your paycheck and your p project are on hold until we've killed Obamacare. They're telling middle class families who want to buy a home they can't get an FHA loan till we've killed Obamacare. Many of the public's against Obamacare, but very few of the public says, hold up everything else till you repeal it. Just a small few. And what's going on here, and I've never seen anything quite like this, is this small few who represent maybe 5% of the electorate but unfortunately, close to a majority in Republican primaries where there's a low turnout, dictate what's going on, hold the country by the neck, and paralyze things. The good news is we do have elections. And if they succeed in their platform, they will fail the way Mitt Romney failed. And here, what they're doing here, they know they're not going to win. They know we will not repeal Obamacare. We have the high ground. If we say to them, we dare you, shut down the government unless you repeal Obamacare. We dare you risk the full faith and credit of the United States until we end Obamacare. They will lose. That's the dilemma. Mitch McConnell and John Boehner are in. They know that but they have this rabid group. So we're making an appeal today to our Republican friends, the half of the House caucus, the two-thirds of the Senate caucus, Republicans who know this is wrong, stand up and make your voices heard, as many of you did on immigration and the Farm Bill and VAWA. I believe those people will stand up. I believe by the time we get very close to funding the government and to full faith and credit, renewing the full faith and credit of the United States, the more reasonable voices will prevail. But we're going to have to go through a lot of convolution and speeches and paralysis until that happens. Senator Murray. Well, I'm pretty sure this isn't what Speaker Boehner had in mind when he predicted a whale of a fight this fall. Uh, but while Republicans are busy fighting amongst themselves, again, Democrats are united. We know that the American people are sick and tired of House Republicans pandering to the Tea Party and pushing us from one artificial crisis to the next. So it really is time for Speaker Boehner to get serious about this. I hope he realizes the Tea Party is simply interested in not governing. That's it. And it's time for him to work with us on a bipartisan budget deal that works for the middle class. Democrats have been working for months to get in a room, work with Republicans, and tackle our fiscal and economic challenges responsibly. But not only have Republicans refused to negotiate, not only have they blocked a budget conference every time we've tried to start one, but now they are pushing us towards a government shutdown in a bizarre attempt to cut off health care for 25 million people, reopen the donut hole, make seniors pay more for their prescriptions, end preventive care for seniors, and, and so much more that we can talk about. Obamacare is the law of the land. I know the Tea Party is fixated 
on sabotaging it before it begins to help millions of Americans. But Democrats are going to fight for our constituents, and we are going to make sure Obamacare is implemented and implemented well. Speaker Boehner clearly understands we're serious about this. That's why the CR that he unveiled earlier this week used a gimmick to ensure that the government could stay open while still funding Obamacare. But that wasn't good enough for the Tea Party. They don't want a show vote. They want a shutdown. And they will not be satisfied until they get one. I'm disappointed that Republicans have pushed us to the point where we need a CR, but now that we're here, they need to stop playing games. I really hope that Speaker Boehner realizes the only path forward for him and for our country is a balanced and bipartisan budget deal. I hope he realizes that Democrats are not delaying Obamacare, that we certainly aren't negotiating over the debt limit, and it's insane to play partisan games with our nation's economy. And I hope he realizes this soon before we lurch into another completely unnecessary crisis. The Tea Party won't like seeing Democrats and Republicans working together. But I will tell you, the vast majority of Americans want us to work together and they want this government to function once again. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dana? This is for you and actually all of you. I'm wondering, uh, after reading Vladimir Putin's op-ed in the New York Times this morning, do you all still feel comfortable with Russia as the negotiating partner to deal with Syria? And, and more specifically, what was your reaction when you read it? I believe that and the White House has said this, and I'm inclined to agree with him. He wrote, he wrote this. Um, I didn't agree with it, but I think he wrote it, and I think it's good he's appearing in an American newspaper. Uh, hopefully that will um, allow him to can do some work that hasn't been done in a long time to come up with an agreement, help, help Syria do what they need to do. You know, he's got that port. He's done everything he can to protect in Syria for the Russian warm water port, and I, we understand why he's been so involved with Syria, but there's no reason that um, Russia, who suffered more with, with chemical weapons in World War I than any other country, out of the 1.2 million casualties in World War I, 440,000 of them from gas <coughs> were Russians. So if there were ever a country that should help, they're it. And so, well, I, 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 it's not a question of not trusting him. Uh, you know, Reagan said it all, um, trust but verify. He seems to be brazenly exploiting the way that the U.S. has handled this, kind of stepping in as the leader and making the president look like somebody who can't handle it. Well, I don't think he's doing that. I think he's just looking for an excuse to show off his, his uh, Super Bowl ring. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Speaker Boehner was somehow manage, able to manage to marshal the votes for this gimmick bill. Would 988 be an acceptable level? For Let's find out what they can do. It's hard to negotiate something that doesn't exist. What, the, what um, Leader Pelosi said in that meeting more than one occasion, let us vote. Let us vote. Let the House of Representatives vote. And as Senator Durbin said, that's the key to get all this done. Uh, he he is really being so unfair to America to have this majority of his majority, which controls no more than five or seven percent of the American people, vetoing everything. So I'm not going to get into whether 988 or um, Senator Murray's number on the budget is the appropriate one. We will deal with whatever they send us. But I repeat, I made the message clear. My three. Colleagues here have made the message clear. Go to something else. Get away from Obamacare. Send us something else that will uh, make, you, make, you, make your... Say, that uh, is the correct question. That is what we should be talking about right now, is what number we are willing to get, keep the government open at. I wish that was the number that we were sitting down and negotiating over, and not over whether they're going to repeal Obamacare, or shut down the government, or do whatever else they're going to do to create a crisis. Senator, what, what did Speaker Boehner ask of you, and what specifically did you tell him you can and cannot do? I told you what I told you what I told him, and that's basically it. Um, I said to him, "What can I do to help?" Because I really feel that way, 
I know that's a personal discussion. We need not go any further than that. But it was not a yelling at each other meeting. It was a it was a very nice meeting that we had. Uh, and I yeah, hey, listen, I I like John Boehner. I like him. But Dick said he. I don't know how you said it, Dick. You feel sorry for him, but you what'd you say? Not so much. But I do. <laughs> but I do feel sorry for him. I mean, he. He he has to break away from those people that are ruining the Republican Party and hurting our country. Yes. Yes. Uh, at what point in time, if the House is not able to pass anything, do you put a CR on the floor, pick up one of the shells, and, and move a CR over here? Well, the drop dead date is October 1st, so we're not going to. I'm sure that the. Um, House knows that we don't have anything here to mess with with tax bills. They've been very careful not sending us anything, and we'd have to scrounge very hard to find something. So we have to wait for them to send us something. Senator, yes. You said that you're willing to work with Speaker Boehner on fixing Obamacare. If you think there are fixes that need to be made, why don't Democrats? We've already done it. We've done we've done lots of stuff. We've done it legislatively. We've done it. We've passed it. Remember that thing with small businesses? We've done we've done lots of stuff. And of course, the White House has done it. But what they're doing is not a little fix. What they want to do is repeal it. And then the other games are playing with our health care and my staff's health care. Senator, assuming that the House Republicans don't send over a, an Obamacare repeal on CR mm -hmm. in a form that lets you uh, cast it aside, um, on the principle of sequestration and it becoming the, the baseline, I know you don't want to talk about 988. Are you, are you standing absolutely by the principle that sequestration should not become a baseline okay. in this bill? Are you going to stick to that? You always get ahead of where we are. The issue today is the CR. The issue in a couple of weeks is debt ceiling. That's right, yeah. debt ceiling. After January 15th, then it's sequestration. But we're not there yet. Last if, question. If, uh, yes, uh, Patty, please. Well, she's, just she's say, the budget I mean, that's, that's the whole point of our budget, replace sequestration in a responsible way. And the House budget did not. We have funding bills that need to be done for 2014. That's the issue that we need to be talking about, how, how we're going to address this. We are unified in our caucus that we need to replace sequestration responsibly. We've been fighting for that. What we have on the other side is a whole mishmash of things, none of them dealing with the budget. Last question. If the House does send you a CR with some sort of attachment. I'm sorry, say that again. If the House sends you a CR with an attachment, be it defunding or delay Obamacare, is it your goal then to send a clean CR back to the House? Yes. Thanks, everybody. Wanted to give you an update on Syria. The Associated Press writes that Secretary of State John Kerry is rejecting Syrian President Bashar Assad's suggestion that he begin submitting data on his chemical weapons arsenal one month after signing an international chemical weapons ban. Secretary Kerry spoke at a news conference today with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Uh, Mr. Kerry noted Assad said a 30 day lead time would be standard. And in response, Mr. Kerry said, quote, there is nothing standard about this process because Assad used chemical weapons. We'll have what the two said before going into meetings today and any update on C-SPAN tonight starting at 8 Eastern. In his weekly legislative briefing, House Speaker John Boehner was asked about his reaction to Russian President Vladimir Putin's op-ed article in the New York Times concerning Syria. Speaker Boehner responded by saying he was insulted upon reading it and has doubts about the Russians and Syrian President Assad. Morning, everyone. Uh, last week, uh, you had another report showing uh, that our economy continues to struggle. Uh, this new normal of uh, slow growth, uh, high unemployment, and stagnant wages. So we've got more Americans leaving the workforce than we have uh, finding jobs. And frankly, I think that's unacceptable. That's why Republicans continue to be focused on jobs, uh, strengthening our economy uh, with our plan uh, for economic growth and jobs. This week, we're again taking steps to dismantle the president's health care law, which is driving up the, the cost of health care and, it making, and making it harder for small businesses to hire new workers. 
Uh, today we passed Congresswoman Black's bill, a proposal that's received bipartisan support uh, to pr protect taxpayers and prevent uh, massive fraud in the health care law. And for the sake of our economy, we'll continue to do everything we can to repeal, dismantle, and defund uh, Obamacare. Another important part of our plan for jobs is reining in uh, the massive deficits and debts uh, that's hurting our economy and jeopardizing the American dream for our kids and grandkids. Now, yesterday I met with uh, Jack Lew, the Treasury Secretary, uh, and this morning met with uh, Leader uh, Reid, Pelosi, and Leader McConnell. And my message to them was the same at both meetings. I reminded them that for decades, uh, the White House, the Congress, uh, have used the debt limit uh, to find bipartisan solutions on the deficit and the debt. Now, these, change, these types of changes were signed into law by Presidents uh, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, uh, and President Obama himself two years ago. So President Obama uh, uh, is going to have to deal with this as well. It's really no different. You can't talk about increasing the debt limit unless you're willing to make changes and reforms uh, that begin to solve the spending problem that Washington has. And unless we deal with our spending problem honestly and forthrightly, uh, the American dream is going to be out, out of the reach uh, for our kids and grandkids. I think our members are ready to solve this problem. Uh, we've shown leadership and we've passed a balanced budget. It's time for the President's party to show the courage uh, to work with us to truly solve this spending problem. Uh, lastly, really on the issue of Syria, uh, I believe that uh, we have national security interest uh, in stopping the use of chemical weapons in Syria and around the world. As I said earlier this week, I've got real doubts about the motives of the Russians uh, and uh, President Assad in offering this current path. But now that the President uh, has made the decision to delay uh, any authorization vote, I hope a diplomatic solution can be found. Questions? Dana. Mr. you said you've got uh, concerns about Russia. Do you have even more concerns after reading Vladimir Putin's op-ed in the New York Times? Uh, I, uh, in a lot of ways I could describe this, uh, but it's probably re why uh, I've suggested that I have doubts about the motives of the Russians and Assad. Thank you. Uh, Speaker Boehner, uh, your conference rejected your latest proposal in order to fund the government through the end of the month. Not quite yet. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of dis there are a lot of discussions going on well, about how okay. about how to deal uh, with uh, the CR. Uh, and the issue of Obamacare. And so we're continuing to work with our members. But if you can't get this simple funding measure through at the end of September, which is fairly routine, how can you get the debt limit extended? And are we going to have a replay of, of uh, 2011? And are you spent There's a, all this speculation it? about, uh, about uh, these deadlines that are coming up. I'm well aware of the deadlines. Uh, so are my colleagues. Uh, and so we're working with our colleagues uh, to work our way through these issues. Uh, I think there's a, a way to get there, and I'm going to be conti continuing to work uh, with my fellow leaders and our members to address those concerns. Are you personally dealing with it? Are you spent dealing with these guys yet? No, I'm fine. Take a day. Take a one year, the, the CR that's being discussed, one year CR that trades the sequester for a year delay. And, are, and are, is it realistic? There are a million <laughs> options that are being discussed by a lot of people. Uh, when we have something to report, we'll let you know. Andrew. Speaker, you, you listed a couple of uh, recent press these occasions in which uh, divided government has produced deals on the debt limit. But there are also lots of occasions in which there was an impasse, like uh, on the budget, and Congress simply increased the debt limit, like in 2002, when the Democratic Senate and the Republican House sent to George Bush uh, a clean that ceiling. Why are you willing to give him one but not President Obama? Well, I'm not going to speak to what happened in 2002, but if you recall, uh, that was on the heels of 9-11 and the economy uh, faltering in a big way. We've spent, we have spent more than what we have brought in for 55 of the last 60 years. 
This year, the federal government will bring in more revenue than any year in the history of our government, and yet we will still have nearly a $700 billion budget deficit. We have a spending problem. It must be addressed, period. Delaware. Madam President, I know